Yeah, so something John and Rich's work has pointed out for a long time is that there's a very limiting set of, of paradigms and beliefs within Southwestern archaeology. Uh, Steve Lexon has given this the wonderful phrase Pueblo space to talk about the idea that because there are contemporary native peoples living in the Southwest, Pueblo people, Diné people, but especially archaeologists are very interested in, in Pueblo people, the, there has been a strong tendency to use what's called the direct historical method or we might consider it upstreaming such that the archaeological questions are how can we extrapolate back to how we got to Santo Domingo today from Chaco Canyon? Which if you think about it is, is sort of a strange way to do history and is really not how history is conducted in most parts of the world. Most, most of the time the approach to a historical situation would be <clears throat> what what is happening here? <laughs> and then you maybe figure out how you got from here to the later historical moment. And yet the, the tendency in the Southwest has been to take what's known as the ethnographic present of the Pueblos or the, the Pueblos as encountered at, at the time of uh, Europeans coming and say, well, how do we get back from this to Chaco? So the entire historical orientation of the field has, has been quite strange relative to, to many ways archaeology and, and history is done in, in other parts of the world. Another part of that is, is what I just pointed out. Archaeology in North America is not set within history departments. If you go to the UK, if you go to Europe, archaeology is, is a historical endeavor. It's a historical practice. What is history? History is the accounts of all kinds of strange contingencies and actual human beings making decisions and having art and, and all sorts of wondrous, convoluted, interesting, complicated uh, humanistic undertakings. But what's the case in North America? In North America, archaeology is anthropology. There are, um, there's even the famous quote by you know, the one who says, archaeology is anthropology or is nothing. Well, what happens when archaeology, the study of past peoples, gets taken into anthropology rather than history? I mean, that's, that's something really different. This relates to questions too, like why, uh, you know, let's take the, I hate to pick on the Field Museum, but the Field Museum in Chicago. Why is it dinosaurs, ge geological specimens of rocks, and then Native American peoples? So this gets, into the, this gets into the history of anthropology and archaeology in the New World, which is rooted in colonialism and racism, basically, where settler colonialists trying to conquer this continent arrived, and, and they were set to show that the people here was simple, that it was sort of a divine mandate to take this land because these people did not have, they were not advanced, they didn't have civilization and these kinds of concepts. Well, I hate to say it, but that thinking be was a part of early anthropology in the Southwest, especially in this idea of cultural evolution, where there are very simple peoples and slowly over time, they become more complex, meaning more like Europeans. And that this was a unilinear track from you living in simple huts under the ground and then eventually you get to uh, settled agriculturalists. And at some level, that's true. I mean. A Paleolithic person lived in a very different way than, you know, a native person in the 1300s. There were definite changes and, and, and architecture did become much more complex. But all kinds of things happened in between. And when we start placing the history of native peoples into this sort of sequence, almost like the evolution of an organism or not thinking about it as history, but thinking about it as anthropology and, and sort of these ideas of how you get from simple to more complex, things get, get quite strange and it's really not historical. You know, let's, let's take something even like the medieval periods in Europe. I mean, we have named people and, and things happen for really strange reasons. People make decisions uh, and not everything is about feeding yourself. That's been a strong a strong tendency in Southwest archaeology and American archaeology and anthropology in general has been how do these people feed themselves? How are they reacting to the environment? I mean, it's almost like we're, we're talking about herds of elk 
Oh, and then the, the, they ran out of food here, so they moved to the next canyon. Well, yeah, of course, people are trying to feed themselves, and they do, they are in conversation with the cosmos, but there's a lot more going on. So that was an extensive preamble to state that for a long time, and still today, many Southwest archaeologists come to these buildings, which as we've heard from John and Rich, are rigorously designed. Not even, yes, planned, but I love that in an early publication, John pointed out, they're designed. And that's a word that doesn't get incorporated into these evolving people following the rain clouds. So these buildings are designed and they're speaking aesthetically. You know, we get the question all the time, why are the buildings so big? Why are the roads so wide? And immediately the interpretations go to economic functional utility. Well, lots of people could fit in here and uh, the roads are wide because they needed to accommodate the timbers they were carrying down them. And what we're missing is a sense of affective impact. What is this building? This is something that's made to impress you. It, it speaks with power to, to one's emotional sense. So it's not a big apartment. And if it is a big apartment, it's for entities beyond the human. I, I feel very strongly about that. So any, if we were anywhere else in the world and we looked at this building behind me, people would say, oh, it's a temple, it's a palace, it's a temple, it's a church, it's monumental architecture, not it's a big village of people, you know, growing corn in the valley behind. 